Hey there, it's Joseph from RoboFlow, here with Jacob. Today, we're gonna to be talking about active learning. So, let's just start it off at the top. What is active learning? So, active learning is the process of training a model, and in this case, we'll be talking about computer vision models, and then going through the process again to retrain and rehone your model as it's learning from the settings that you've put it into. Um, so, let's uh, talk a little bit about why you might wanna do active learning and kind of how, how, how that process might work. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think, I think as you mentioned, it's active learning is, as it may be in contrast to, to passive learning. So typically when we, we train a model, we feed it a bunch of data and we hope that the model learns what we're aiming to learn. Let's put this in the context of a real problem. Let's say we're training a computer vision model to recognize uh, individual species of dogs. Uh, so, um, in this case, uh, we might have very common dogs represented in our data set, like golden retrievers, Labradors, beagles, but then there also might be dogs that are, you know, less popular in our data set. Um, maybe for example, we have, uh, ha just so happens we don't have many poodles or many corgis in, in our data set. Um, well, when we train a model, of course, we pass all these images so that we hope the model learns what each of these species are going to look like. But when we first get our uh, model trained to identify individual species, we might see that it could be doing better. And specifically, maybe it'll do better on some of the lesser represented species. And so passive learning, I guess, would just say, you know, let's just keep collecting images from as many dogs as we see, scrape the web, put on the uh, Animal Planet, screenshot the TV, put all those images back into our, our, our data set, and hope that we find the dogs that our model's performing poorly on. Active learning, on the other hand, says, wait a minute, we can be you know, more intelligent about this. The why for active learning is we can accelerate the rate at which our model improves its performance by taking a series of active steps for passing data to our model that's going to most improve its performance. So in the dog example, let's return and say, I don't have enough corgis. So whenever we get another image that's captured that is of a corgi, we should prioritize getting that data back into our training set, retraining and redeploying. Now, I mean, you asked about the, the why of active learning. And I think the ultimate why is it can improve your model much more quickly. Um, and much more efficiently with your resources and time. Uh, maybe you don't have to spend that much time labeling data. Your model is learning from the places where it's most likely to fail. But man, Jacob, this sounds like a lot to, like, to set up. Like active learning relies on everything from like getting the initial model into production, or at least maybe into a testing phase, to setting up systems for collecting additional images and, and labeling. I mean. Can you walk us through, like, how do we set up a successful active learning process? Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing about the active learning process is it, it's just a lot more work to kind of hone and build this pipeline that you're gonna be using to go back and retrain and redeploy your model. Um, so maybe it's not the first time you go through the flow where you're setting up uh, your, your pipeline to be training your model and, and doing active learning through these through feeding it new data, but certainly by the second or third time, you're really gonna wanna be thinking about how can I set up this process so I can efficiently go back through and return through the loop again um, as, you're doing, as you're doing the retrainings. Um, so that goes through kind of the whole pipeline from uh, where you're actually sourcing your images from, where you're storing them, how you're organizing them, how you're labeling them, and then how you're going through the training process um, and then the deployment process and, and, and kind of re-slotting in that new model that has been actively learning. You wanna think about how you're going to be doing that time and time again. Um, certainly, like I said, by the second or third time you train well, maybe the first time you just wanna see if you can get everything to work together and, and get through the process once and see if, the, see if the computer can learn your task. But after that, you really need to think about um, investing in that, that uh, 
active learning process. So what, what do you think are some of those ways to streamline that process and how to best, best implement it? Yeah, you hit on a good thing there, which is you first maybe want to see if the model can learn your task, and then you maybe want to be uh, fine-tuned and do better. And you did a good job of breaking down the steps too. So in like machine learning operations or ML ops, you know, there's, there's DevOps for developer operations, and we have ML ops for machine learning operations. What you touched on of each of those steps are all affected by uh, effective active learning. So for example, when we have our model that's running in production, that's you know, identifying these, these dog species, um, it might be wise for us to use that same model, that's the one that's working in production, in our development process to help us hone in on which images we should be focusing our time and attention on to improve our model's performance. By that I mean, like, let's say that I said, you know, we had Labrador Retriever and Golden Retrievers in our data set. Maybe every once in a while our model is mixing those two up, right? And so new images come in and you could have a human, a human go through and say, oh, you know, here's, a, I'm gonna go through again and say, here's the Golden Retrievers, here's the Labradors, here's the Golden Retrievers, here's the Labradors. But maybe in the majority of those new Golden Retriever and Labrador images, the model would do a fine job with them. The model would get them right. And there's only a select few that the model might get wrong. Mm -hmm. Which means if we could use the same model that you have in production for understanding, exploring, sorting your data, then suddenly your time as the person that's setting up this process mm -hmm. is only spent on those smaller set of cases where things look wrong. And so what that might look like tactically is we're going to use the same model to sort our new image data that's being collected. And we might want to say, whenever the model is either at a low confidence level um, or maybe the model doesn't predict a, a, a class at all in this, in this example, um, then we're for sure going to have a human go in and review and say, you know, these are the samples where a model is, is performing worst. Um, so one key step, I guess, is, is make sure or consider using the model that you have in production for actually understanding your data in development. Mm -hmm. um, and so you would actually consider limiting taking a subset of those images for the next training pass. Um, yeah. You would actually be using the model then to kind of hone down, maybe even after annotation, um, to, to look at the most informative images. Yeah, I mean, so I was talking to a user who's like training a model on um, various animals and wildlife uh, from safaris. <laughs> and on these safaris, they actually see you know, um, and pictures of lions far more frequently than like wild dogs, for example. And so let's say that, you know, in this active learning or in this, in this model process, you know, it does an okay job at identifying our initial animals, but we just have way, 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 way more lions. And so when we get more images that come in from our inference conditions that we sampled, when our, um, and if that image say is a lion with maybe 90 or 95% confidence per our model, we're not even going to include it in our data set for the second pass. Well, I mean, we'll store it in case we want it for something else, but for the purposes of training, we're actually going to say, you know what? I actually have enough lions. I actually have a pretty bad class imbalance. I have too many lions. I need to pair this back and only find when I have one of these lesser represented classes for the purposes of, of training my model. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, it sounds kind of crazy because we know that machine learning models are very data hungry to say that like, you know, actually you don't, maybe want all of the newly collected data. Um, or even it's just, you know, identifying the, the cases where, as, as you said earlier, where the model is, uh, is performing worst. Now, I kind of touched on the importance of maybe using the model that we have in production for the purposes of continued organization and like development of the data set. Mm -hmm. But another thing about active learning that strikes me as really important is being able to quickly redeploy. Mm -hmm. Right, because if you if you really get this right, in an ideal case, you'd almost be able to you know, redeploy your model very very frequently. Let's say your model is running um, daily on like you know twelve hours of video, and every single day that your model uh, could be better, you want it to be better. So maybe you want to do like a deploy Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, mm -hmm. Thursday, Friday, in the most like extreme mm -hmm. case, or maybe you could be even faster than that. Could you touch on some considerations of like? the importance of having that infrastructure set up? Like how would you even, how would you even tackle having such 
regular deployments or uh, making sure that we can have our model continue to be updated. Yeah, certainly, certainly. So this was a little bit about what I was talking about, getting, getting kind of a solidified flow where all the tools you're using as you're going through the process are the same because you wanna make sure that that model that comes out at the end of the process is, is identical in terms of software dependencies and all the things that it needs to run as the first time you finish your flow. So you're, you're getting through the flow, you're getting this new model, and you wanna be able to just kind of slot it in efficiently or redeploy efficiently. And um, that process is, is highly dependent on kind of using the exact same pass that you've done. Um, so no matter which, which tools you're, you're slotting in, uh, you wanna make sure that you're going through to kind of slot in all those tools uh, together. And we, we've been working heavily at Revoflow to kind of streamline this process to bring, bring together different tools that we think are best to suggest um, to kind of fill that flow. So we think we're starting to connect a lot of those, but obviously we wanna make it, um, we wanna make it so you can kind of plug and play different areas, of, especially if, if you've found, um, you know, something in the computer vision ecosystem that you really wanna stick with, you wanna be able to put that um, into your process as you're, as you're working through and you're redeploying. But yeah, I think this, this whole active learning thing is, is really, an important thing to keep in mind as you're training a model, because unlike most other computer software, a model is not, it's not a thing that you write once and then it's just gonna work, right? It's not like you're gonna just get your detector for uh, dogs or cats or whatever you're trying to, to detect and then, and then it's just game over and you've connected A to B. Um, things are gonna change, the world changes. Your model is gonna be in new, new settings and you need to be thinking about how to expose it to these new things and retrain it and redeploy it. Hmm. Um, I don't know what you think about conceptualizing active learning that way. But. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Like model drift, mm -hmm. right? Like not only does active learning allow you to uh, improve more quickly in the same setting, but in new settings mm -hmm. um, or conditions can change without you being aware of it. Uh, and active learning helps combat that to your point. I think one of the, the ironic things about model drift is it's the model stays the same. <laughs> But the, the, it's actually like data drift, right? Right. But but we we call it model drift because you're you're kind of like it feels like your model's shifting from underneath you. Right. Um, but really, it's it's the fact that you just haven't That's kept good, up yeah. with, with the with the settings. Right? I like that reframing. Yeah. yeah. The model's performance is drifting, but it's not because of the model. The weights are the same. Yeah. It's the data that it's being exposed to. That's yeah. It's data drift, not model drift. I like that. I think one other thing that you mentioned in the deployment process is. Um, having consistency of, of the architecture. Let's say you've, uh, you have like an endpoint stood up that when you feed an image or you pass a video feed, you expect back, you know, coordinates of a bounding box. You wanna make sure that you don't have to like re-architect that API for like maybe you like swap out a, a, a model or like you swap out different architect. The, the more um, changes that you make to even just the hosting of that part of the overall flow, the harder it's gonna be to redeploy quickly. So in an ideal case, in an ideal case, it would be like the API point endpoint is actually the exact same. And maybe you change like one parameter mm -hmm. to say that like, hey, now like my model is called like model three, yeah. model four. Yeah. And the rest of my app can stay self-contained. The image still gets passed to the, the, uh, that endpoint. The endpoint returns back their coordinates of the bounding box and the rest of my app makes its decisions with the business logic of when I have yeah. this bounding box or when I see three sheep or you know whatever it is. Yeah. Um, or even better yet, you just redeploy the endpoint. You don't have to change any of the code around it. Right. That's uh, that, that's that, that'd be ideal, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think that that's um, important consideration. Um, so I mean, of course, the general uh, we've touched on this a little bit that at Roboflow we're focused on making active learning at the center of what we do. I think one thing I want to mention is the. Um, idea that you said at the very beginning of start with one model and then improve that model. I think actually like the way that computer vision and machine learning generally is going to evolve in a good way is you could start with a model that might work somewhat well for your domain um, rather than starting completely from scratch and then tailor that model to your domain. So maybe you start with like, you know, maybe you're building like a plane spotter model that's going to count planes because uh, you're just interested in, in plane spotting maybe as a hobbyist or maybe you're an air traffic controller, whatever it is. You can maybe start with 
the Coco model because airplane is a class in the Coco model. Um, now they spell it A E R O P L A N E instead of A. So that's that's already you know something that I'd, I'd personally change. <laughs> but you'd want to make sure that you know the conditions that the planes you're seeing might look a little bit different. And so instead of saying, okay, I need to go collect all these data of planes of my planes, you can actually say, maybe I can look and see how does the COCO model work in my domain, mm -hmm. or even how does the COCO model work at automatically labeling images in my domain, and then I'll spend my time correcting labels. And you're mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. you're, you're, at, you're at step two. You're mm -hmm. not starting at step one of, man, I need to have like some of my data and images collected. You're starting at step two of how do I tailor an mm -hmm. existing model to my domain? Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that we're focused on making really simple and easy so that teams can get that mm -hmm. time to value reduced um, you're almost in, you're almost instantly starting into the active learning flow right. as soon as you start. Right. So um, it's active learning by default, I think is is really, really compelling. And then you can even get more specific, right? Now that I can identify airplanes, can I identify 747s uh, from 777s, right? Or like Airbus from Boeing models. And like you can start to get more and more specific of the things that you're curious about. But active learning frames, I mean, in a lot of ways, it turns machine learning from this like big, big waterfall process if I need to have everything like perfectly mm -hmm. done before mm -hmm. I get to step two and a bit more agile of like, I have a model that works. Mm -hmm. I know mm -hmm. it's failure cases. I can send those failure cases back and, and redeploy. And so it makes things be a lot more um, uh, efficient and, and drives value in, you know, maybe in like a month of a project instead of it being like a three quarter investment yep. for what you're working on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the sooner you start thinking about active learning, the simple cases, the less technical debt you're going to incur as you go forward in the process, because you're going to want to end up doing it eventually. Right. Especially if you're getting serious about actually doing it in production. Right. Um, yeah. Well, I think that's, that pretty much wraps it up for our, our, our discussion on active learning today. Thanks for joining us. And as always, uh, like, and subscribe below and we'll see you in the next video.